What I have behind me here is a 50 watt CO2 laser made by GWIC. This is a three grand machine. And what I want to explore is whether paying three grand for a machine like this is worth it or not. Can we make that money back? And if the cheapest 10 watt diode laser is about a tenth of the price, how does it compare against 10 of those? I'm Joshua Delisle, the designer maker. Let's have a closer look at this machine and see if it's any good. All right, so GWIC, or GWIC, depending on what your preference is, are quite a large manufacturing company in China. Now, they don't just sell desktop lasers. They actually sell all the industrial brands that basically built China. So these guys really do know what they're talking about when it comes to lasers and anything CNC. So GWIC has entered into a market of desktop lasers that is currently dominated by Glowforge. The GWIC Cloud Pro is their answer to undercutting that market. These kits come with an extraction air filter filter and the air assist all in one unit. It also comes with a remote operated 60 watt ducting fan. I decided to mount the ducting controller on the machine itself. The machine's mostly made of fabricated steel and tempered glass. Now if we take a look under this seemingly important cover here, we reveal the laser tube. If we turn the machine on, you'll notice it's fairly loud. Let's chuck a bit of wood in and see what it does. Now a CO2 laser works by exciting the CO2 with an electrical discharge. There's nitrogen and helium also present in the tube. What happens is as the laser light is emitted by the CO2, it reflects off two mirrors. One mirror at the end has got like a tiny little hole where it can emit the laser. And that basically loops around in some mirrors back to the laser head. You see how these turned out. Turn it off so you can hear me. There you go. So this is nine millimeter hardwood ply, single pass, 85% power, 200 millimeters per minute. But first, let's quickly look at the differences between a CO2 laser and one of these, a diode laser. So overall, CO2 laser is more powerful, more precise, they're generally cheaper to run per watt of power, and the laser tubes themselves last a lot longer than a diode. So diode lasers are more affordable and are a lot more simple. However, there are some major differences in the wavelength of the beam. So for example, a 20 what diode laser came up with these results. Let's do the exact same test just here on the CO2. So what you saw me chuck in there is a piece of 304 stainless steel. Now stainless steel is a really poor absorber of infrared light and a CO2 laser produces infrared. The wavelength of this CO2 is 10 microns, but the diode lasers that we've been using produce 450 nanometers. In essence, that shorter wavelength is better absorbed by the stainless steel. And typically the power density of a diode laser is higher than a CO2 laser. And there we are absolutely nothing. Now what some people do is they coat it with something in order to engrave stainless, but as you can see, diode lasers are far better at doing that. Now another difference is the processing controller. CO2 lasers typically use a digital signal processor, a DSP, commonly known as Ruida. Now diode lasers typically use Garble or GRBL. Now Garble is open source and readily available for most people. Now Ruida is industrial standard. It's meant to be more reliable, more accurate, accurate, has more features and better control. However, what I found that if I want to use it on Lightburn, I actually have to pay extra for that privilege. So Lightburn cost me about 50 pounds to get the license and then to use the DSP controls, it's an extra 50 pounds on top. Once you don't have to pay that if you just use Garble. But just like Glowforge, GWIC actually have their own cloud software, which means that you can basically operate it from the internet. Well, that's where Glowforge fails because that's the only way that you can operate it, whilst this thing you can actually operate using Lightburn, which is what most of us typically use for our lasers. Now these particular types of machines have built-in cameras also. Let's see how that works. So the way it's meant to work is we're projecting an image of the work area within the software. That way we can accurately position our pieces when cutting it onto a piece of board. So for example, within Lightburn, we can actually draw shapes accurately. So if I put that there, you can see I've drawn a little square just here. Just set the parameters. Now we can cut that little square out. Let's have a little look at it. Here we are, just like that. Not a bad feature at all, I don't think. 
What I will point out though is to get this accurate is very tedious and time consuming. I don't know whether it's the type of camera that this machine uses or whether the software just isn't good enough yet, but it's very difficult to get it accurate. Now the Pro version also comes with a rotary Y-axis set. We'll have a look at this in a future video, I think. But that's a job opportunity in itself. If you can buy bottles like these in really cheap and say put them on Etsy with custom engraving, well that's a whole market but it's a saturated market. Now a diode laser can cut, let's say black acrylic, but what it can't cut is clear acrylic. And that's because a CO2 laser cuts it at the right wavelength. Let's give it a try. As you can see, I had to engrave with the tray out. That could be a bit of a safety issue, but it does mean that we can have longer strips of wood go through here. Let's have a look. Ooh. <sighs> that came out all right. Let me show you the magic bit though. <laughs> look at that. That's really cool. And that's opened up a whole level of possibilities. So let's talk about running a business with possibly 10 diode lasers. Now the Comgro Z1 is probably the most cheapest on the market at the moment. That's just over 300 British pounds. Pay 50 quid more and I think the longer model is much better just because it's got this offline controller. Now I would have shown you the Comgro one. We actually reviewed it in a previous episode, but I've given it away, unfortunately. But for reference, let's just imagine that this one is a 300 pound machine, which means 10 of these would equal one of these. So as you can see, I get given a lot of these lasers to test out. And what I've been doing with some of them is raffling them off for charity. So if you're interested in taking part in that, there will be a link in the description. But rather than get all of my lasers down to do this test, we're just gonna hypothesize it. So 300 quid for the machine, what else? do you need? So both systems require a computer, so we'll cancel that out. But if we look at the Comgro laser for example, we can actually operate 10 of those from just one computer. Another cost may be a table to work on. Now looking online you can get a decent table to hold all of this machine for just about £200. But equally if we have 10 diode lasers we can actually stack those on racking. And a 5 shelf racking which can hold 2 of these lasers on each shelf is about 200 quid also. Now the only major extra part would be the extraction and the air assist. However I'm going to put it to you that you don't need this for this machine. In fact there's not much to be desired for having one. As far as a filter goes it's pretty useless it doesn't filter everything so unless you have really particular neighbors this isn't really going to help you much and although it does have air assist it doesn't have a dryer so what I would prefer to do is link my compressor to this machine which does produce dry clean air it's also in another workshop making it a lot quieter and so with the same compressor I can feed air to all of my other 10 machines now the GWIC also has this extraction fan at the back there if this was straight ducted out of the wall, that would be enough. But we're guaranteed quality extraction with the included ducting fan. So on our racking, we do need to think about extraction and making sure there's a good cover so that the laser light isn't blinding us by accident. Because that's one of the major risks to these open systems. Those lasers are dangerous and the slightest glare will blind you for life. So you really do need covering and extraction. So on our previous test, the Comgro did quite well. It cuts nine millimeter applied 100 millimeters per minute, no problem. But that's it, full power, 10 watts. However, if we go slower and do lots more passes, you actually get a really good cut with not too much burning. Now, if we upgrade to 20 watts for a single pass, we can go twice as fast. But to point out another benefit of a diode laser, we can simply place it on top of material. Well, the GWIC, you've only got so much space. So for the GWIC, you're gonna have to invest in some sort of a saw to cut your material down with. Now, the GWIC does have a slot going all the way through. I don't know if you can see it there, but it's the tiniest little slot, so you're not going to get much through it. But let's do the same test we've been doing on this piece of wood with this machine. Right, so on first investigation, I was getting really confused. The typical test was underperforming. You can see I only got two squares come out. Now these tests are generated within Lightburn itself. There's an option to do that. And what I realized is that the test wasn't accounting for the Z axis. And so it was always setting it back to zero rather than accounting for the material thickness. If I take the cover off, 
You can see we've got a tiny little stepper motor which controls the focal height. This is the mirror and there's your lens. So what we can adjust in Lightburn is the material thickness. And so it automatically changes the height of the laser to match whatever material you've put in. To do the material testing, we go on laser tools, material test. And then here you can set the parameters of whatever test you want to do. But for whatever reason, it wouldn't account for the Z height. On realizing that, I just cut my own squares out and they came out really good. So as you can see, a single pass, four 400 millimeters per minute, 100% power, and on 8 millimeter hardwood ply, there's very minimal charring to the sides. Now this 50 watt laser will cut 99% through at 500 millimeters per minute. And so closely looking at all the tests that I've done with all of these machines on this material, we can cut on average 10 millimeters per minute for every one watt of power. So a 10 watt machine can cut 100 millimeters per minute, 50 watt machine can cut 500 millimeters per minute. So we're cutting five times faster with one of these compared to the 10 watt Comgro. So surprisingly, what that works out to be is that we've just five of the Comgro machines, providing that we're working to just what a Comgro machine can do, so that would produce the same output as having one of these. So technically, you're saving a grand and a half not buying this. And I think if I'm going to invest my money like that, starting small, just 300 pounds, getting that to make some products, and then building up from there may be a viable alternative. But as I mentioned before, a diode laser won't last. You'll have to replace it over time, whilst these last a lot longer. However, if you've got more than one machine, Machine, then if one breaks it's not so much of an issue. Whilst if this breaks that's all of your product line stock. However the other alternative is if we have that same stacking system and let's say had five of these machines well you can generate quite a lot of product in a very small space. Now you can obviously cut a wider range of thicknesses and materials on this and it gives a really good precise clean cut and when running a business reliability and consistency is actually your top priority. And I think the argument would be in the long term um, is it cost effective? Well, so if this is going to last a long time and keep producing product no matter what, compared to replacing machines constantly, well, this is going to pay for itself, isn't it? Let's actually create a real product and do a costing, shall we? So it's my daughter's birthday coming up and she was very specific that she wanted a bunk bed with a desk for one of her dollies. So I came up with this thing and I think I'm gonna turn it into a saleable product. So I've saved the parts as DXFs and transferred them to Lightburn. Let's cut them out. So Lightburn tells me exactly how long a piece is gonna take, but I'm gonna do a time in motion study as well, just to see how loading and unloading this machine takes. So let's begin. Right, so here's all the parts cut. Now you will have noticed that there wasn't a 100% cut through rate. This is just standard ply that I bought from a hardware store. And it has lots of inconsistencies, such as these metal parts that are inside it. It was also slightly warped, so it meant that the focal point of the laser wasn't cutting accurately. So I think birch ply or bamboo ply would be a lot better for doing these kind of projects. So if I'm gonna sell these, I'd sell them as a pack that you kind of self-assemble when you take it home. To finish these off, I've got another tool, this. This is a chamfering tool and it's actually meant for steel. What I found is it works great on this stuff too. So there you are, that's the before and that's the after. Right then. That is now all the parts done. There we go. Right, so what does this work out financially as far as a business goes? The hourly rate for a workshop, I think, is about £35 an hour. That includes wages to pay someone to do the work on all the workshop expenses. We've got an hour and a half, so times £35 an hour by 1.5, 52.5.
Now we've got to add the expenses such as materials. Looking online, materials can be very expensive, especially if you're going for acrylic or birch ply. I think we can get them down to about 30 pounds to make one of these. So plus 30 pounds. We've now got to consider postage and packaging. That's, I reckon, about 20 pounds. I'd have to double check that before I commit to anything. So far, we've got 102 pounds 50. So although we've got wages, we still need to include a profit margin and about 30% is about right. Profits are what you've got to then expand the business, invest in more machinery. So we're now at £133.25. Plus we've got to add online marketing at a roughly 15%. That brings the total cost to £153 roughly. So now you've got to consider is something like this worth 153 pounds? So let's say we invested three grand into our machine and we're just making these. We're making roughly 31 pound profit. Let's call it 30 for easy maths. We need to sell 100 of these before we've made our money back. So interestingly, if we look at having the 10 machines like we suggested, we're reducing the hours by half, which comes to £26.25. Add our £30 materials on top of that, add our packaging and posting at £20, we get £76.25. Now the profit margin on that is £22.75. The overall cost to customer is now reduced down to £114, which is a bit more affordable than £153. However, we now need to sell 132 of these to cover our initial investment. So obviously, depending on how much profit you want to make, those figures can change considerably. The better return on your investment, the more you can expand by buying more machines. But something's only going to be worth what someone's prepared to pay. So the actual product itself is crucial to the business. Something that you do want to consider, though, is all the waste product. All of that was just from this. Now with wood, it's not so much of an issue because it will just go into fueling my home for the winter. But if we're say using like an opaque acrylic, which isn't easily recycled, well then you may want to consider redesigning so you're getting the maximum out of your material. But otherwise, yeah, birch or bamboo is quite a good alternative. So let's finally sum this up with all the negatives that I have with this machine. Although the cutting area is bigger than the other lasers, the others are 400 by 400, this is 500 by 300. It's roughly the same in volume actually but it's a bit more handier this size what i don't like is the fact that it is enclosed i can't just drop this on top of a piece of material like i can the other lasers there's a little coolant bottle in here which has got the fluids to keep the uh, laser tube cool you can't get access to that very easily the camera i don't think is very good at all but what's interesting to know is that through lightburn we can actually use any kind of usb camera so i could technically put a camera on these units as well what really irritates me about this machine is the fact that the air assist and the extraction can't be turned on and off using g-code it's just on so i might have to make a switch for it otherwise i'm going to link it to the compressor now the tray itself is powder coated and gets completely marked what this wanted was a piece of sacrificial stainless steel to drop in there which is a bit of a shame really it wouldn't have costed much extra just to put that in and of course the air filter isn't great and it's not necessary i don't think i think if the cost of buying this machine could have been reduced by getting rid of the air filter and the extraction and using your own options i would have been more inclined to have gotten that the glass as well worries me not just from damaging it but the fact that i can still see the laser i know that's better than the open build lasers but really you don't want to see that laser at all so i'd be tempted to put another cover on top of this and then just rely on the camera for just checking in on things but what i do like the build quality is excellent everything seems robust and it seems to be all very well aligned it's obviously very powerful and very accurate so there's a lot to like there so the next videos i'll be doing with this is reviewing how much money i can get this thing to make i've got several official products that i'm going to be making with this and selling on my Etsy shop. And if you think any of the information that I've given you is incorrect or you'd like to hear more, then do let me know in the comment section. The comment section is the best place to get the correct information from all the other experts that are out there. In the meantime, can I tempt you into watching this video? Then if not, can I encourage you to stop watching YouTube and get out there in the real world? Forge for yourselves a life worth living and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.